Well, when we talk about the Bible, we're talking about the most influential book in all the world. And there's a lot of reasons why it's so influential. Uh, it is the most discussed book in the world. Libraries, theological libraries are full of commentaries and theologies and word studies about the Bible. It is the most distributed book in the world. We're told at last count there were about 5 billion copies sold around the world over the course of, of uh, it being available in many languages. Two billion copies have been gifted through the Gideon's organization and ministry that gives out free Bibles. The electronic distribution is incalculable. Nobody knows exactly how many electronic Bibles there are. And I have one on my app, and you probably do, and I've got the Bible app, and every morning I get a verse of the day, which I read faithfully and distribute to my family. And pray for them as I do that verse, its application, their lives and, and uh, ministries and walk with the Lord. We know that it is also the most translated book in the world. By October 2019, there were 680 languages with an entire translation of the Bible. The Quran maybe has about 150, but as you know, Muslims don't consider any translation of the Quran a translation they considered an interpretation because you really have to read it in Arabic, not so with the Bible. It doesn't have magical powers. It has to be understood, breathed, and uh, believed and applied to our lives for it to have real efficacy. The English uh, language alone probably has about 480 translations. There are another 1,500 plus languages that have the entire New Testament. There are another 1,100 languages plus that have a portion of the Bible. That's out of 6,500 languages on the face of the earth. Most of the remaining languages are often uh, languages without any kind of uh, literary heritage or capability or their, and or their languages of very small groups ethnic groups that uh, are quite either remote and or uh, inaccessible, or they're ethnic groups that have a major language in the country where they live where they're also reading the Bible, whether, whether it's in English or French or whatever topic. But it is the most translated book in all of history. It is also the most valuable book in all of history. Uh, recently, a page out of the Gutenberg Bible went on auction at Sotheby's $400,000, one page out of the Gutenberg Bible. It's estimated that of the 30-some remaining Gutenberg Bibles, uh, one Bible would cost about 40 to $50 billion million at the going price. When I lived in Germany uh, a number of years ago, pastored there in Wiesbaden, uh, a Bible was discovered in the attic of a little church in North Germany. It ended up in the Gutenberg Museum in Mainz, right across the river from where I lived in Wiesbaden. And needless to say, the financial worries and woes of that church were forever uh, met. Uh, let me just encourage you, go back to your church building, clean out the attics, look in all the closets, because if you find a Gutenberg Bible, that your church is not going to need many financial resources. They ought to keep giving, obviously, but uh, being facetious about it, it is the most valuable book in the world. Not to speak about the value of the ancient manuscripts like the Dead Sea Scrolls. Great Isaiah Scroll is mounted in the museum, Shrine of the Book, in Jerusalem, but it's mounted in that part of the museum that in the case of an air attack or a bombing, the whole museum on an elevator can be lowered into the earth to protect it. And it's the single most valuable item the Israeli government will tell you in its possession or in anyone's possession as far as that's concerned. We're gonna talk as well about the most influential uh, book in the world, and that's, that's the Bible. Uh, and the point about that is 
the influence of the Bible has been enormous in terms of the forming of culture, values, uh, ministries, impact on our world in practical ways. We're going to see how that has played out. But in some ways, it's been put on the table for easy grasping and easy access. Uh, recently, two years ago, I think it was, three years ago maybe now, the Museum of the Bible was launched and uh, dedicated in Washington, D.C. There's a whole floor of that eight-floor exhibit dedicated to one thing, the impact of the Bible around the world in the United States and in many other places because there's no more influential book in my estimation, and I think in many, if not most people's estimation, uh, for good, certainly, in the world than the Bible. Uh, we'll go on from there, and we want to uh, realize, too, that while it's the most influential, valuable, uh, translated book, it is also the most censored, forbidden, distorted, banned, burned, resisted, and criticized book of all time. In fact, there are at least 2 billion people on planet Earth that have limited or no access to the Bible. And that would, include, uh, of course, include uh, people in China where Bible possession is severely restricted, even though China produces and publishes large numbers of Bibles for sale around the world. That would include many, many Muslim countries where the Bible is forbidden. That certainly includes North Korea where to own or to possess a Bible may get you a long-term labor camp sentence or perhaps even the death penalty. Why is it resisted? Why is it criticized? Why is it banded? Why is it forbidden? Uh, I can remember 1975 making my first trip into uh, Eastern Europe, into Communist Europe, into Romania, Hungary, the then Yugoslavia taking Bibles, uh, some interesting stories about that. But I asked myself the question, why would they forbid the Bible? The communist propaganda was it's a stupid book. It's a crazy book. It's a violent book. It's a pornographic book. It's a silly book. Well, if, it's, if that's the case, why not allow it to be distributed? Why not allow everyone to read it? because once they read it, they're going to reject it anyway. But we know that's not the case. That was just the propaganda line, because they realized those governments did, as do present governments that forbid it, the real power of the Bible in terms of changing lives, changing cultures, and changing nations. The unique nature of the Bible, let's think about that for a few moments, because the Bible, in a very real sense, has a dual nature in that it has a human element. It reflects the styles, vocabulary, and experiences of its human authors. It is also uh, divine in nature in that God, the Holy Spirit, inspired the thoughts and words of its human authors. Second Timothy 3.16, all scriptures inspired of God. Second Peter 1.21, the Holy Spirit drove and moved the prophets to write the inspired word of God. It is not to say that the Bible is always inspiring. There are many books in the world that are inspiring. They teach us important lessons. We're inspired to read uh, great stories about people uh, who overcome great obstacles and so forth and so on. There are parts of the Bible that aren't necessarily inspiring. I don't necessarily get inspired reading some of the genealogies. I certainly don't get inspired reading some of the trickery about some of the trickery and violence of uh, ancient kings, including some of the kings of Israel or their pagan practices that they introduced into Israel. Those aren't necessarily inspiring, but it means the Bible is inspired. That at its origin, God was involved working through human instrumentality to produce a holy and unique book for us. Um, therefore, the Bible reflects true human engagement of God in the real world recorded in history. So the human side of this book shows that the language, style, context, history, culture, 
events, personalities, geography, all reflect real life, real people, real events. It reflects real styles of language in the authors. It re reflects their context and time and history. And it means, therefore, that it can also be testable and verifiable. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But we also know that the Bible is divine. At the bottom of the page, you see J.I. Packer's definition of inspiration to be defined as the supernatural providential influence of God's Holy Spirit upon the human authors, which caused them to write what he wished to be written for the communication of revealed truths to others. It effectively secured the written transmission of the saving truth, which will get us into the concept of inerrancy. So let's just think about this for a few moments. Inspiration. The authors were moved upon by the Holy Spirit, writing these books, reflecting their time, their cultures, their use of language, 40 different authors over 1,500 years, but saying what God wanted to be said and verified by none other than Jesus Christ himself, who used all of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, to talk about his ministry and about our ministry, that the truth of Christ would be preached around the world. But because it's inspired, it also means it is inerrant. I encourage you to have a look at the Chicago Statement 1978 on biblical inerrancy, a fabulous statement that defines, clarifies, and uh, answers many of the questions about what inerrancy is and what it's all about. Carl Henry's six volumes on scripture and authority, uh, the magnum opus on inerrancy. John Feinberg's recent book, Light in a Dark Place, is uh, absolutely a jewel. Peter Williams, who's participating in this conference, his one volume, more popular treatise, Can We Trust the Gospels, is a must read for anybody involved in apologetics, evangelism, or teaching related to scripture. Let's thank for uh, inerrancy for a few more moments. And let me read to you what Feinberg has written in his book, Light in a Dark Place, uh, about inerrancy. He gives us a definition. He says this, inerrancy means that when all facts are known, very important, when all facts are known, the scriptures in their original autographs and properly interpreted will be shown to be wholly true in everything that they affirm, whether that has to do with doctrine, morality, or the social, physical, or life sciences. sciences. When all the facts are known. We had a uh, academic discussion with Bart Ehrman, the great skeptic, the former evangelical, who's written a number of books attacking the inerrancy of scripture. Uh, he is very uh, manipulative in what he says about the number of errors in scripture because he'll take one error out of one manuscript, say that's the right uh, phrasing in scripture, and then he compares it to all the other thousands of manuscripts in scripture and says, well, you know, uh, there are thousands of mistakes because this one's manuscript is the correct one. So he's very manipulative about that, but he was talking about uh, the, the fact that he believed the Bible had many mistakes in it, as if it were a fate accompli. I just asked him a question. I said, uh, Dr. Ehrman, can we really say these are errors? Can we more uh, satisfactorily and in a true academic sense, say they're discrepancies. Because it's like Feinberg said, when all the facts are known, we cannot know all the facts about any historical event. We can know the ones that we can affirm by history and other aspects of study and investigation. But if we say something is a mistake, that means that we know everything about that particular event. Maybe it's a lack of information that keeps us from deciding uh, whether or not it has error. And if we knew all the facts about all the events, then we could say positively it's an error. But if we don't know all the facts, it's just a discrepancy. He refused to answer the question. 
because he knows that's the bottom line. When all the facts are known about any text and any part of scripture, we will learn and we will know, or we can see that it is indeed the inerrant word of God. Uh, that's not to say that all we, we have all of our questions answered here and now because we certainly don't. But let's think for a few moments again about the whole issue of, let's go back, Mark, to testable and verifiable. We can know enough about scripture to see how reliable it is. Why? Because it is uh, probably one of two religious books that are written telling real history or claiming to tell real history. Now, the other book, along with the Bible, that claims to tell real history is the Book of Mormon. Well, I can spend five minutes and tell you, tell you and show you that obviously the Book of Mormon isn't telling the truth about history and historical events. The Bible is the other book. And we can discover there that the Bible is the most reliable book from a historical perspective for many, many reasons. One being simply things like history, geography, language, and so forth. That the actual events in the Bible are traceable, they're documentable in many instances. We can take our Bible, go to Israel today, and do a nice tour of Israel following the directions and the descriptions of the land as the Bible portrays it. We also know that time and again, archaeology has confirmed the reliability of Scripture. For many years, people said, well, there's no proof that Pontius Pilate was ever the governor of Judea. Oh, okay. Until about 1961, two archaeologists working in Caesarea Maritima discovered a, a slab of stone, and they said, there's something written underneath that stone. It was in the old amphitheater uh, built by the Romans there. They turned over the stone and they discovered the words Pontius Pilate, perfecter, governor, that is, of Judea. End of debate on whether or not Pilate was, the, was truly the governor of Judea. Archaeology is, in a very real sense, our friend. Very interesting article here, published in the Biblical Archaeology Review, uh, September, October 2017. New Testament political figures confirmed. The author investigated 24 secular personalities in the New Testament. He asked the question, how many of these can we verify by non-biblical sources as being the people and holding the positions that they said they did according to the Bible? He, in that article, confirms 23 out of the 24. The only one he doesn't confirm is Philip the Tetrarch, not because there's any evidence against uh, who the Bible says he was, but because he hasn't found enough evidence that he can say strongly, affirmingly, that, the, that Tetrarch, uh, Philip the Tetrarch was exactly who the Bible says he was. So the Bible is testable. It is verifiable. Let's look at this thing for a few moments about the issue of prophecy. The Bible is the only book in the world that is truly prophetic and is reliably prophetic. Uh, uh, Barton Payne in his magnum opus, Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy, once president of the Evangelical Theological Society. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But Barton Payne, uh, has cataloged over 1,800 prophecies in the Bible. Uh, there are about 8,000 verses of Scripture that speak about those 1,800 prophecies, which comprise about 20% of the material in the Bible itself. So real places, real events, real uh, personalities, all these things are contained in biblical prophecy. The fall of Tyre, for instance, in Ezekiel 26, the return of Israel, and of course, a hundred plus prophecies about the person of Jesus Christ. We should never shy away from examining the supernatural inerrancy of Scripture and its uh, 
faithful prophetic voice that it's given to us down through history and even at this present time. So we have the, the dual nature of the Bible, divine, human, uh, it's inspired, it's infallible or inerrant. It is also not only those things, it is authoritative. It's authoritative for our lives. It's authoritative for our cultures. It's authoritative for our world. So when we talk about the Bible, we have to talk about the impact of the Bible on culture. And this is where we come in as academics because there's virtually no part of academia, no discipline within academia, almost no discipline within academia where the Bible hasn't made a life and world changing impact. And where you, whatever your discipline might be, where you can't also make a life-changing and world-changing impact. Education. What an amazing history and legacy the Bible has given us of education and the importance of it in terms of, of uh, Christian influence from the very get-go, going back to, by the way, the Hebrew scriptures themselves, where education, learning scripture, being literate, we're an part, important part of the Hebrew culture, unique within the world itself. Where the New Testament carries on that legacy. The word became flesh, the articulation of God in meaningful, understandable forms through a visible manifestation in the person of Jesus Christ. The, the fact that he inspired scripture to begin with and he inspired his disciples to write Holy Scripture means that literacy, reading, the ability to understand and interpret education, that is, is a very integral part, integral part of the Christian worldview and manifesto. So from the very beginning of the Christian movement, catechetical instruction for both sexes was important. Religious orders for men and women which involved, by the way, the teaching and the training in Christian truths, however they may have been expressed or informed in the course of uh, a thousand years, some of them uh, extra biblical adding to the Bible, but that was again a fault of perhaps not being thoroughly biblical enough. The organization of religious institutions, the earliest universities in the world, the Sorbonne, Oxford, Cambridge, etc., were the products originally of pastoral training and education. So what is the motto of Oxford University? Uh, Deus Lumina Meo, the Lord is my light. A direct quotation from scripture itself because they all started as pastoral training institutes and theology was considered the queen of the sciences. We could go to uh, the New World, to the United States, or what was the, the British uh, North American colonies. 126 of the first 128 colleges and universities formed in America were Christian institutions. Harvard's motto was Veritas, truth for Christ and his church. By the way, that has been modified, so it's just veritas, just truth. This is not only true in North America, it's true around the world where Christian missionaries sometimes were the first to introduce literacy, higher education, colleges and universities. My son married a beautiful Christian girl from Pakistan. He met her while working at Foreman Christian College, a missionary college started 200 years ago, one of the first universities in the world. By the way, Islam is catching on to this feature and they're now trying to support and start uh, universities all over the world, including Africa, South of the Sahara. They also see the value of this as a, an evangelistic tool. Medicine and healthcare. Well, we don't have to go far from the Bible to realize that things like the parable of the Good Samaritan taught the importance of uh, medical care and uh, care and concern for the sick and injured. Monasteries, 
the early monasteries were often the only place someone could go and get some form of informed medical care. Have in my hand Christian History volume, the magazine, Healthcare and Hospitals in the Mission of the Church. And this deals with just healthcare in the uh, early church up through the late uh, uh, Middle Ages and on the verge of the Reformation itself. Uh, modern missions full of the saga of healthcare. David Livingston was a prudential doctor who treated sickness and illness wherever he went. Mission hospitals around the world. I've, I served in one in what was then Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, in a remote area because there was no medical care of any shape or form, but Missionaries went in there, started a hospital, and ministered to the people. Today, we're told that 40%, for instance, of the health care in Kenya is as a result of Christian ministries driven by their view of the Bible to love your neighbor as yourself. Science. Many people consider today science is Christianity's enemy. Let me encourage you to read John Lennox's book, God's Undertaker where he addresses this thoroughly. The whole point about science is it was birthed out of the concept of creation, that there was a sovereign God who created the universe. He made man steward over it. And part of our stewardship was to study, investigate it, and to explore it for our own benefit and our own enlightenment. Great book here. You've got to read this book, The Victory of Reason by Rodney Stark. Let me just read you one short quote. The rise of science was not an extension of classical learning. Uh, historians have tried to portray Greek philosophy and uh, Greek worldview as having driven uh, scientific research, but he says no. It was the natural outgrowth of Christian doctrine. According to Christian doctrine, nature exists because it was created by God. In order to love and honor God, it is necessary to fully appreciate the wonders of his handiwork. Because God is perfect, his handiwork functions in accord with immutable principles. By the full use of our God-given powers of reason and observation, it ought to be possible to discover these principles. That's the worldview that gave fruit to the modern discipline of science. Let's thank for... And we could talk about benevolence, by the way, but that's, that's more than we have time for right now. But uh, I think you'd probably uh, come up with a lot of great illustrations about how benevolent work and ministry is rooted in a Christian worldview. We're seeing that at work at COVID-19. Our church is giving literally about $30,000 worth of food away to out-of-work people every week. Uh, David Green built that museum of the Bible, not to make money off of it, but as a ministry. By the way, David Green, founder of Hobby Lobby, is a reverse tither. He lives on 10% of his income. He gives 90% of it away. Uh, it's interesting too, isn't it, that Paul in his final address to the Ephesians in Acts 20:35 says, remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more bl blessed to give than to receive. But if you search the Gospels, you won't find those words. It seems that those words were so familiar and so quoted and so distributed and, and communicated among the early Christians. It was a known fact that Jesus taught these truths. Well, we can go on and look then at some of the individuals involved in uh, the whole issue of influencing the Bible. We can see that every discipline, by the way, is involved. We look at Augustine, his major world apologetic on uh, a Christian worldview, the city of God, his advocacy for care of the sick, his education of both sexes. Uh, etc. These are important. We could talk about Luther, his unlocking scripture, his solo Christos Fide and Grazia revolutionized the world. And these were very vital and important. His use of debate 
uh, as a forum for establishing the truth, his advocacy of the reading of scripture, his translation of the Bible that basically formed the modern language language of Hope Deutsch or High German. Isaac Newton, although he had some aberrant views towards the end, it seems, of the Trinity, was a great student of scripture. Robert Rakes, who was Robert Rakes? He was a merchant in the 18th century, a textile merchant who was converted under George Whitfield, who saw a need in his culture. Uneducated children, 90% of the children in his generation had no form or access to any kind of education. He started the Sunday school movement, which was basic, basically having schools on Sunday using churches, ministers, and the Bible to educate children. And of course, introduced the concept of universal free education. Martin Luther King, uh, the strength of love led the, the great uh, reform for civil rights in the United States. And I wish we had time uh, to go on to others. Let me just mention one, Johannes Gutenberg. Gutenberg invented the invention of the millennium, according to Time Magazine, the movable type printing press. What was Gutenberg's whole motivation behind the invention? Well, you see it right there. It is a press, certainly, but a press from which will flow in inexhaustible streams. Through it, God will spread his word. A spring of truth shall flow from it. Uh, and that's Gutenberg's whole motivation behind creating the, the movable type press. Let me just mention in wrapping this aspect up the life of William Carey. I encourage you to read anything from Vishal Mangawaldi. The book that made your world is one volume. Uh, this book changed everything is another volume that deals with uh, the influence of the Bible, but also his volume on the life of William Carey. I wish we had time to deal with these aspects of Carey's ministry. Yeah, he went out as an evangelist Bible translator, but look at the areas of academic discipline he was involved in, including crusader of human rights, spent 25 years legislating against Sati, the burning of women at the death of their husband, burned alive on their funeral pyres. He uh, militated against that and finally got the, the British civil government to outlaw that. But while he's doing that, he's also evangelizing, translating the Bible in the six, the entire Bible into six languages and portions of the Bible and 29 others. But read um, Vishal Mangawaldi's The Legacy of William Carey, and you'll be amazed at what one person can do. So let me just finally conclude by walking through how this applies to us today and what we need to be aware of. And our, what about us? Conversion. How many of you were converted reading the scripture? How many are still converted? Uh, one survey done of Muslim background believers, what was the greatest influence in your coming to Christ? Reading the Bible. Guidance and correction. Never think you outgrow your need for daily scripture reading and direction in your life and meditation. Mission and purpose. What is it that the Bible's telling you, God's word, about things you could be doing and should be doing to make an impact for his name's sake on your culture, your world, your community? So what is your role in all of that? Well, uh, Jesus said, if you are ashamed of me and my words, so shall the Son of Man be ashamed of you when he comes in his glory and with all the holy angels. Therefore, we stand firm on the scripture. We see its vital place and importance in terms of impact in our world. We see the need to live according to its mandates and directions, the need for the saving message of the Bible to be heard, the possibility of seeing its ongoing influence to change our world for the better, to answer the great needs that face our world and face our communities. COVID 
virus, 19? What difference is the church making uh, to meet the needs of people in this pandemic that spread across the world? We pray that the legacy of Christian ministry and witness, according to scripture and motivated by it, will be enormous for the cause of Christ and the gospel.